Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm, I'm honored to be here, and uh, I uh, am very glad to do my first uh, Outer Ontario tour uh, to Alberta, the land of the free, as I'm told. Um, so when our, uh, when our uh, video is ready, I'll just play it in the middle of, of the talk, just because I like it. I want you guys to see it first. We just finished it, and uh, I just I want you guys to see it. So um, I got into I, I got into, I got into this race. I got into politics. I never intended to be a politician. I didn't grow up wanting to be a politician. I grew up wanting to make money and uh, start businesses and uh, do things that conservatives like to do. Um, I used to own a small business. I've been involved in several small businesses. I founded my own small business. I then went to law school. And um, along the way, I realized that they weren't training law students to be lawyers. They were training them to be political activists. And the lawyers there didn't have the same type of views, not even close, on freedom of speech and freedom of conscience that you and I share, or even that the average Canadian to a lesser degree would share. And so I was concerned, and I felt that uh, if average guys like me who would rather just be minding their own business don't get involved, then it's going to be those guys who are getting involved. And they play for keeps. They don't believe in you doing your way, I do it mine, we can all just agree to disagree. They don't believe that. They believe if you disagree, you're not only wrong, you're evil. And if you're evil, they want to come for you and they want to discredit you, take your job, uh, take your position, take your reputation. Um, this is what we're seeing more and more day by day. We, we, all, we all have seen it. Uh, many of us have been victims of it. And um, that is why I'm here today. I'm not here to uh, make a name for myself. I'm not here to have um, you know, accolades and that type of thing. If, if I wanted to be popular, I would probably be running a different campaign. Um, a variety of times in this campaign, my slogan, conservative apology, has gotten me into trouble. Uh, I suggested early on that Dr. Teresa Tan should be fired. Here, here. I, I, still believe, I still believe that, and I think that she should step down immediately. But at the time, um, this was sort of in the midst of all that was going on, and that was not taken too kindly. It was called racist and all these types of things. And certain politically correct elements in my own party uh, tried to kick me out. And, uh, you know, I had a, I had a you know, discussion with my wife. And I said, listen, I, I got into this. I don't want to be derailed this early in the campaign, but I got into this to be the leader I want to see, even though I'm not the leader yet. And so I don't, I'm not going to step down. I'm not going to back off on this. And she said, I'm with you. Don't give him an inch. And I wish my wife was here. My wife, my wife and family are a great support. So I did it, and everything was fine. It's an interesting couple of weeks. And now, of course, no one says anything about it at all because it's very clear that we messed up uh, based on following the advice of the World Health Organization and their complicity with China and all these types of things. So um, part, of my, uh, part of my point today will be to, to discuss Canada, Canadian unity, discuss my candidacy, and um, hopefully, and of course, give you some time to ask me some questions as well. So I don't know if I get to go over a little bit or if, I, if I'm stuck at the, I'm stuck. We have a hard deadline because we used up a few of the minutes early, but we, if we, we, we are going right to the 1.30s. So you can watch Okay, the so we'll, I'll, I'm watching the clock and I'll be sure to leave time for the question and answer as well. Yes, and I just say that you will also be here tonight too, so like a lot of people will have questions if they don't get them answered at the end of your hour, they can submit them to us and we'll see that they get answered in the fireside chat tonight. So I'll try to deliver for a couple of questions, but you know, fear not, there will hopefully be a time tonight as well to ask additional questions. Thank you for pointing that out. And also, I, I'll hopefully I'll be able to uh, distinguish myself in some way from the other candidates. Um, I don't have anything against the other candidates, but of course, I am, my job is to convince you that I am the best candidate to lead the party, so I'll do my best to do that. Um, listen, I am, I am not naive when it comes to the, the strength of the separatist uh, sentiment and movement, and I'm not here to tell you that, oh, if we just build a pipeline or something, that it will all go away, because I know that it won't. 
And I know that there's some people that think that just you know some positivity and some some movement on the energy file will do that. And I I am not uh, I do not believe that. Um, I do believe though that uh, it was not by accident that Canada became a nation and escaped uh, being subsumed into America during its expansionist age. And I believe that the uh, sentiment, which comes from Psalm 72, 8, he shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth, applies to Canada. I believe we have a global mission to share our values of freedom, of peace, order, and good government. And while I respect and encourage the rights of provinces and peoples to, to promote and, and fight strenuously for fair treatment and their own rights, I believe that Canada is better together. And um, I understand that there's others that disagree, and that's fine. And I won't, uh, I won't dwell on that, but I believe that we have a mission to the world to share our values, many of which are shared the strongest in this province. And I believe that Canada is better off with Alberta part of it. Um, to transition to the, the leadership race a little bit, this, this current leadership race is a referendum on not only the direction of the Conservative Party, but the direction of Canada. And it is, it is based on the idea that we either need to stand true to our values and our convictions, or we need to water them down to a point where it becomes palatable to the populace at large. And I believe that we need to um, give a vision that draws people to us, as opposed to moving uh, to the center and watering down our beliefs. So, of those two choices, we can never back down and we can never compromise on those. So that is what I believe, and I'm going to share a little bit of, of some of the things that I've spoken about. So many of you have, have potentially been following this race, but I will talk about um, wh what I see the federal government being able to do, uh, not only for Alberta, but also for the entire country. So we have to be looking, we have to be willing to look. Oh, okay, so apparently our video is ready. Uh, let's play it. Freedom comes at a cost. Canadians know this better than most. We are a country who prays to God every time we sing our anthem. God, keep our land glorious and free. I'm proud of this anthem. I have raised three beautiful children alongside my wife, Jen, and there's nowhere else in the world we'd rather live. I'm Derek Sloan, and I'm running to be the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada. We need to keep Canada true. True to our history, which is full of heroes and villains as well. This is our history. It cannot be ignored or swept under a rug. We need to keep Canada strong. And a society is only as strong as how it treats its weakest and most vulnerable members. And we need to keep Canada free. Freedom comes at a cost. Canadians from generation to generation have fought for this freedom and paid for it with their lives. We will never forget them, and we promise to continue the fight, whether it be in support of marginalized members of our own society or oppressed people in foreign countries. Join me, and together, let's keep our land true north, strong and free. I'm Derek Sloan, and I ask for your number one vote on the leadership ballot. So I'm going to move a little bit to sort of my plans as a leadership candidate and my intentions uh, as a federal candidate. Uh, um, so I, I believe, of course, that uh, when it comes to uh, dealing with provincial issues, particularly uh, Western uh, resentment, we have to, uh, and you know, John Robson mentioned this this morning, we can't be I don't believe this is solvable without, a cons with, without constitutional changes. And we need to, you need to have a leader who is willing to, thank you. 
Yeah, we need to, we need to be willing to, to do that. Um, the representational issues, the Senate issues, the equalization issues can't be solved without a, without, without a constitutional convention. So um, to my knowledge, I'm the only candidate that said that that is where we must go, and I believe it's a must to address these issues. So, um, and we all know what those issues are, and I could, you know, we, Alberta has fewer MPs per capita than other areas of the country, and, and the Senate, of course, is allocated as a block, we all know the issues. So it's something that, that will need to be addressed, and, uh, and that's something that I'm willing to do. When we're, what I mentioned earlier uh, about the energy industry, restoring the energy industry uh, is, a, is a, a bare minimum. I mean, that's the idea that that's all it will take, of course, is, is not true. And uh, we need to not only repeal, repeal Bill C-69 and C-48, we have to get out of the Paris Agreement. And I'm the only candidate. Thank you. I'm the only candidate that is making that commitment, and I have repeatedly tried to, tried to twist others' arms uh, to do so to no avail. So um, on that alone, um, I should be your number one choice. That's, that, it, you know, and I don't have to tell you guys why we should be out of the Paris Agreement, but uh, the Paris Agreement should really be called a wealth transfer agreement to China, because that's what it is. Yeah. That's what it is. So um, we, have to, we, have to, we have to actively progress the conservative movement. We can't just put the brakes on. And what I feel we've been doing with our general strategy of, and our general strategy has been, listen, let's avoid controversy, let's just focus on the economy, and then when we win, we'll do some other things. And what inevitably happens is that uh, we win occasionally, but all we're doing is putting the brakes on the radical social agendas of the liberals and the left in this country. So we have to do much more than that. We, ha we have to actively champion conservative values in such a way that, that draw people to us. So we can't, uh, water down and move to the center. Now, does that mean we can say things smarter as opposed to dumber? Sure, but it doesn't mean that we move. We stay, we, we make compelling arguments, we dig in our heels, and we bring Canada to us. So, um, I, also, I also believe that instead of making the economy the, uh, the linchpin for an electoral strategy, as important as the economy is, don't get me wrong, we have to make freedom the linchpin of an electoral strategy. And there's been so many encroachments on, uh, you know, free speech, freedom of conscience, all of these things, religious liberty. And, you know, I should say, I didn't, I didn't really tell you my full story, but uh, going, to, going to school as a lawyer, um, being a small business owner and then going to school as a lawyer, I, I thought I would actually uh, do work like John does. Uh, in, in defending religious liberty and other types of things. And I actually worked with an organization uh, that intervened on behalf of Trinity Western University in 2015. And I, I helped them work on their factum and, and so on. So, um, and I know many of the religious liberty uh, and, and other types of lawyers that, that John knows, I have them on, you know, know them, know them very well. And um, I, uh, I uh, began to realize, particularly uh, after seeing the results of certain cases, that uh, we need, where, where there's every one, one John, we need a hundred of them. However, um, you know, when you have the best lawyers, common sense, and even the law on your side, many times that's not enough. And so I said, you know what? I'm going into politics where, uh, you know, I can make a change from that perspective. So uh, that's, that's initially what I wanted to do, and I eventually decided to go into politics. But um, we need to be the strongest party when it comes to free speech when it comes to freedom of conscience, and I believe that I have uh, the strongest policies when it comes to free speech. So um, I've targeted, um, well, things like Bill C-16, for example. I've, I've said, I'm getting rid of it. That's the bill that uh, Jordan Peterson became famous uh, arguing about. You guys are aware of that. Um, cracking down on universities that are promoting cancel culture and not enabling uh, you know, free speech. Yes, an M103, of course, is something, I don't think you can actually undo a motion, am I correct on that? But you can, who knows, I guess you could, you could do another motion that undoes a prior motion. 
maybe. But um, in any event, yes, I'm totally against that. I don't, uh, I don't agree with the concept uh, of uh, making hate speech illegal because it, it ultimately becomes politicized and one group tries to use it against another. There's no you know, way to arbiter that. So um, we need to be exceptionally strong in free speech. And, uh, and another issue that I'm, that I'm taking issue with is all this banning on social media. So we, we, we're, we know that Google and some of these other, these other companies, Google, Facebook, YouTube, Google is changing their algorithms, uh, or at least there's good evidence to suggest they are, so that you don't, you know, try, putting, try searching for something controversial. It'll be on page 10, you know what I mean? And, and, and websites that are, you know, arguing against what you're searching for are on the first nine pages. So um, there's good evidence to suggest that Google's manipulating their algorithms. We know, I mean, Rebel News, I've mentioned this before, did an interview with uh, a guy that was working with a unit in the States during the last election, censoring, what was it, hundreds of thousands of Facebook posts, something like that? Uh, anything critical of the NDP or, or open borders? I mean, if that happens on my watch, that's election interference. That's serious. So we need to deal with social media banning. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring forward a law that prevents uh, social media companies from just banning you uh, for being conservative or having, you know, traditional values. If they have like a, you know, a basic upfront, you know, you can't use the F word or something, I mean, that's fine. But, you know, these guys are altering and editing and doing anything they want. And yet at the same time, they are saying, oh, well, you know, we deserve, uh, you know, we deserve protection from, you know, uh, libel and slander and all this stuff because we're neutral. We're neutral platforms. Well, they're not neutral, and we need to make sure that we enforce that. And there's all kinds of things. Even YouTube came out with the policy. Any video that, that would contradict public health advice in terms of COVID would be pulled. Well, I mean, there's, there's so much different advice out there. Any video could contradict public health advice, right? So, I mean, these kinds of things are silly, and they are positively dangerous when it comes to um, things like COVID-19, where there's all different kinds of information out there, and we need to make sure that we're informed. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, freedom is such a broad topic, but I've been the only person, for example, that has been unequivocally and repeatedly against mandatory vaccinations, for COVID or otherwise. And I think that, um, I think, of course, people, basically the point is people need to have a choice about what medical, uh, you know, routines are done on them. I mean, that should be a basic, uh, you know, uh, sentiment of a, of a free society. So I've been very clear on that. I've been critical of these, these mandatory mask orders and things of that nature. Sorry, I think I'm staring over here more for some reason. I don't mean to... Sorry about that, guys. Nothing personal. Yeah, on the right side. That's right. Yeah. These guys are on the left. That's right. That's right. That's right. Who's left, right? Who's left? Yeah. So I've, been, so I've been very clear on that. I don't think anyone else has, uh, has spoken about that. Um, I've been very clear on the parental rights issues. So part of, I mean, obviously the vaccination thing is part of that. But I've been the, the strongest and boldest to talk about Bill C-8 and Bill C-16, uh, which undermine parental rights when it comes to, and, you know, basically promotes um, the, the rapid increase in gender dysphoria that we're seeing. And I actually... Um, signed a petition by, by a transgender activist in BC, which is asking for a, nat a nationwide inquiry into the, into the reasons why we're seeing so much higher uh, uh, representation of transgender kids in the foster system. So we're seeing uh, these kids, they're far more likely to be being put on drugs and stuff like that, that alter hormones and alter development when they're in, you know, vulnerable situations like being in foster care. And, and uh, some people are saying we need to get to the bottom of this, and I don't disagree. I mean, uh, we know that most kids, uh, there's very good evidence, the longest longitudinal, longitudinal, longitudinal studies we have show that the bulk of kids will grow out of this by the time they reach adulthood, meaning the 80 plus percent of kids who think that, who identifies a different gender will actually identify with the, the body they were born with by the time they're adulthood. So, the question is, well, okay, why would you roll the dice and put them on drugs or try to transition them if there's a good chance they're going to grow out of it? So, um, 
you know, we, we see governments like the UK banning uh, gender reassignment surgery, sex change operations for kids under 18. The UK is not a religiously fanatical government by any stretch. Um, and I've said, not only am I going to fight against Bill C-8, but I'm not going to let these kids transition. It's a free country, adults, if they want to do that, they can do that. But I'm not going to let kids do it. And I think that's a fair thing to say. And this is, this is one... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You know, I think this is, this is one example of where conservatives can dig in their heels. We don't have to dig in our heels on everything. But the thing is, is that the liberals traffic in controversy. So if our strategy is avoid controversy at all costs, we have very little to talk about. Because all they're talking about is abortion or this or that. And the more that we have something to say, the less they can, the less they can hammer us on it. Because if we're just being quiet about everything, then they're just going to hammer away. And so something like Bill C-8, which potentially would criminalize parents for trying to get their kids some... To try, if you were to try and get your child, who is a boy, for example, that thinks he's a girl, some counseling, to make him feel satisfied with the body he was born in, with this bill passed, you and the therapist could, could go to jail for up to five years. That's what this bill says. So, I mean, whatever your opinions are on conversion therapy or whatever, this is a major overreach. And this is... The liberals brag that this is the most progressive law of its type in the world. Now, if some of the other leadership candidates can't find a way to criticize the most progressive liberal law in the world on any subject, you're not a, you're not a conservative. So these are the types of things. Now, do we make a whole campaign about this? No, but I mean, we can dig our feet in on this. We can win in the, the GTA and the 905. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of new Canadians there who are very family valued oriented. And when they look at us, they just see, oh, well, you know, the conservatives, we hear they don't like immigrants and like they're kind of just to this like big business cutting tax thing. And the liberals, well, yeah, I don't like their values, but at least they like me and like whatever. Like that's kind of the, the way that they're, they're taught or, or they're, that's the, that's the brand the liberals try and paint us with. And so really, if we have some values issues where we can say, no, listen, we are different from the liberals and we do have values that accord with you. There's great examples in Ontario, Premier Doug Ford uh, took the liberal majority to only seven seats. They only had seven seats out of 121, I think is the total seat count in Ontario. And he swept the GTA and, and the 905 by being, a, in part, but a major part of his, his uh, strategy was being against the sex ed curriculum that the Liberals had brought in. And that was really popular amongst new Canadians. So the idea that we can never touch, you know, these values issues is wrong, you know? I mean, the, the Liberals have gone so far in so many things. Abortion is another example. Um, you know, we have no laws in this country on abortion. And it's not challenging to, to stand in, in some way in opposition to that. I mean, it's not challenging to do. So there's a lot of ways that the Liberals try to divide us that we can use to our advantage. And they like to traffic in controversy, and we say, oh, we're going to avoid it, and, we, and then we're quiet, and then they just spread rumors about how we have some hidden plan or this, that, and the other. Well, we don't need to have a hidden plan. We can have an open plan. But we need to dig our heels in on some of these things, and that's a way to expand our base as well. So I've been, I've been labeled by the Toronto Star as the most socially conservative candidate in this race. I'm not going to call that fake news. I think that's true. <laughs> but, you know, in all fairness, I'm much more than that. And those that know me know that um, my interests in, in conservative values are, are much more than that. But um, avoiding social conservatism is impossible to maintain credibility amongst our own base, and it's impossible to gain any ground in the cities. Um, you know, the, the moderate-leaning people who are really concerned about whether we're marching in a pride parade or not, um, they don't want to vote for us anyways. So if we become a liberal light party, maybe we'll win a few votes, but not many, right? I mean, if you want to reach out to, I mean, if you want to reach out to the LGBT community, instead of marching in a pride parade, which I will not do, as I've said before, um, why don't we get hard on terrorism, right? I mean, I, I speak to so many people in that community who are really concerned about terrorism, political entryism, 
um, doing business with some of these regimes that are flouting human rights around the world. I mean, there's lots of things we can do that are truly conservative that don't involve virtue signaling to every single group. We, we shouldn't do that. <laughs> so, um, you know, I mean, I've, I've spoken, I've spo I have spoken a lot in terrorism and I've been very clear on the need to literally combine our police, intelligence, and military and focus on infiltration, whether it be from China or Iran or uh, radical Islamist groups and uh, also radical environmental groups. So it's something that we have to take very seriously. And we know, we, I mean, we have, we've, we have reports from CSIS dating back decades of the ways in which communist China is you know, influencing and, and trying to cozy up to municipal and other types of politicians. We know this, and yet we're not doing enough about it. And we know about political entryism when it comes to different radical groups. We need to take that seriously. We need to start investigating, seizing assets, and making it clear that that type of behavior isn't tolerated. Um, you know, I, I, another thing as conservatives we have to do, we have to buck the trend when it comes to, you know, there seems to be, you know, these, these rules that, you know, we have to be in favor of free trade all the time with everybody. Um, you know, we can only talk about the economy. I mean, all of these, these ideas have to go. We need to focus on, um, well, I was actually trying to transition into uh, terrorism, but I guess we'll talk about trade a little bit. We need to, we need to of course, promote trade that's good for Canada. And for free trade, for example, with countries like China, who are actively stealing our technology, uh, you know, undervaluing, devaluing their currency, um, trying to flood our market with, I mean, even fentanyl is, is the word on the street, right? I mean, so we can't be, and they don't allow us to invest in their country the same way that we would here. So we have to, we have to play with countries that want to play with us. And so we need to, we need to start modifying some of these things when it comes to, uh, you know, another way that we can reach the, the, the city audience is dealing with housing. I mean, we've been an open book when it comes to just foreign investment in our cities. I mean, we've, we've had no restrictions on resi for residential real estate purchase by foreign countries, basically ever. We, we've had a surtax now in certain jurisdictions for a couple of years. But you know, we have these high-level apparatchiks in the Communist Party who are buying 10 or 15 houses just so they can scroll their money away somewhere. You know, we have communities in BC, half the community, no one lives there. I mean, in what, in, in what country or in what world does that make sense? It makes no sense. So I've said, listen, um, we need to, well, we also need to cut our immigration levels, which is another story. And I'm the only candidate that's talking about that. And, you know, and there's so many things that I'm the only candidate that's talking about. And I, and, and I wish the other candidates were talking about that, but you guys need to know what's out there. And we do, we do need to reduce immigration levels. And, and part of it is because that also has an impact on the massive rise in housing prices that we're seeing in Toronto and uh, lower mainland BC. Because, I mean, and I, did, we, I had some people on my team do some research on this, but, you know, the, the traditional conservative argument is, oh, well, that's not conservative, you just need to build more houses. Well, Toronto was the fastest growing city when it, comes to, when it came to building units. I think in 2018, they were faster than even Phoenix. We were the fastest city in North America a couple years ago in terms of building new units. We built 27,000 or 28,000 new units in, in Toronto. We had 150,000 people uh, join the census in, in, in the greater, or in Toronto proper that same year. So you're, you're having a massive supply and demand issue then, when you combine that with money laundering that's going into real estate, when you combine that with unrestricted foreign purchasing, I mean, no wonder the average detached home in Toronto is over a million dollars. I mean, how can people, um, you know, when my grandparents moved to a small town in the 50s in Canada, they bought a home for $9,000 and they paid it off in three years. They were photographers. They were middle class photographers in a small town and they paid off their home in three years. I did some calculations. You would, you would have to be making, na uh, um, combined, about half a million dollars a year uh, pre-tax as a family in this day and age to be able to pay off any kind of a house in three years, certainly not a house in Toronto. 
But, and that would be if you put most of your after-tax money into the house and not, you know, food and other types of things. So, I mean, the destruction of our standard of living has been extreme. And it's been based off of a variety of things, probably our monetary system, probably, you know, f crazy government spending, all these types of things. But we need to start taking a look at, at the destruction of our standard of living. And a lot of that comes by putting Canada first and allowing, you know, China and other places to have unrestricted access to our markets, uh, re residential real estate and others is an issue. So I would put a moratorium on uh, foreign purchasing of residential real estate until we get a handle of what's, of what's going on. I would ban Chinese state-owned enterprises from buying resource projects here in Canada. Full stop. These are, these are things that um, are damaging Canada and we need to put them first. And we have to put, we have to get rid of, you know, age-old conservative values like, oh, or, or perceived conservative values. Oh, well, restricting foreign buying would be anti-conservative because it's like, you know, um, undermining the free market. Well, I mean, we have to get away from that. We have to think what is good for Canada, what puts Canadians' families first, and that will open up avenues for us as well with the blue collar crowd that is that is maybe typically voted NDP, but now has an NDP leader who is actively, you know, trying to destroy the energy industry, trying to destroy all kinds of blue collar jobs. So we need to pick up on that ground by promoting uh, cost of living issues as well. And it's more than just cutting taxes, although we do need to do that as well. So um, I'm the only candidate that is this. I'm the strongest against green, subsidi green subsidies, and I've been very clear on that. There's, there's been some agencies that have done reports. Canadians for Affordable Energy have done reports on all candidates. I was the only one that got a good report from them, um, and, uh, and I've been very clear on that. I don't think that we should be spending money on green subsidies, and I, I don't think the other candidates have been uh, very clear at all on those issues. Um, we have to increase our military spending look at northern sovereignty, and have more of an active foreign policy. I don't believe that Canada uh, should just be, uh, well, we can be a peacekeeping nation, but sometimes to keep the peace, you have to use a sword. And I think that there's times, thank you. I think that, there, I think that there's times, for example, in the Syrian conflict, when Justin Trudeau pulled out our fighters and gave them winter coats instead, I think that's an insult. I think that there's certain times where there's moral no-brainer issues in the world. We don't have to be involved everywhere all the time. It could be Rwanda, it could be, uh, you know, when ISIS was beheading Christians and other people in the Middle East, where we can get involved, maybe with our allies, but we should be getting involved in more than just a, a morally, you know, uh, send out a tweet, high-minded type of way that, that other people do it. We need to get involved in some of these things, and I think we need to meet our NATO commitments when it comes to military spending. So, thank you. So, I, I don't think I've been able to, to, to talk about everything. I've been the strongest sovereignty candidate of all of them. I've spoke repeatedly about the Mass Migration Compact, United Na Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. I've been very critical of the UN. I've been the only person to say that we shouldn't give a dime to the World Health Organization at all. And these things matter. And these things are things that keep Canada free. And I know that I don't have to convince you uh, today on the, uh, the reasons why we should do those things, but they're important. And if somebody's not standing, I mean, here's the thing. We all know that in these leadership contests, the, the strategy is to like kind of veer right and then soften out a little bit in, in the real election. Well, if the veering right that some of these other candidates are doing now is their veer, well, God help us when they move to the center, because, you know, I mean, we're not seeing very much veering, in my, in my view, in this campaign. So just keep in mind that no matter what these other candidates are saying, they're giving you the strongest conservative message you will hear right now. And there hasn't been a lot of strength. There's been some things that, are, that have been good, and I'm not targeting anybody. There's been some things that have been good, no question. But it hasn't been all that strong. So I just want you to keep that in mind as well. Um, I haven't even got to talk about, do we have our firearms video? Oh, good. All right. Well, 
You guys get to, you guys get to be the first audience to see two different videos. So um, whenever you're ready, you just go ahead. But I'll, I didn't get a chance really to talk about firearms, but I also have the strongest firearms policy. I, I keep on saying I have the strongest. Don't take my word for it. You can look at the policy. It's true, but just look at it yourself. You don't have to take my word for it. But um, every single candidate in the race is talking about repealing what Justin Trudeau has done with the firearms. Um, that's not enough. I mean, if all we're doing is undoing what he's doing, we're not taking back lost ground. So not only, um, is, are you coming to pull me off, eh? Oh, so okay. If, if you just speak real loud while he's plugging it in, okay. we'll just... We are, we Repealing Justin oh. Trudeau's gun grab is a bare minimum. I've promised to do much more. Yes, we need to repeal what Justin Trudeau has done, but we also need to take back ground that was lost decades ago. I'm the only candidate who is actively advancing legal gun ownership rights. That means enshrining in law rigid self-defense protections for the judicious use of a firearm, and also enabling things like handgun hunting and self-defense, which used to be legal in Canada for many decades. It is not enough to simply repeal what Justin Trudeau has done. We need to actively advance the cause of legal firearms owners. I'm Derek Sloan, and I ask for your number one vote on the leadership ballot. Okay, so um, I'm sorry to just smother you guys with information here, but I'm just going to use every minute I have because uh, I've been given it. So um, I've given you a good sense of, of, my, of, my, of my plans here. I, I'm also very serious about all the government funding that we're doing to these eco-activist groups and other groups. So I've listed some of them, um, you know, the Tides Group, which is now known as Make Way, uh, the World Wildlife Federation, the Sierra Club. There won't be a dollar of federal funding that goes to any of these under my leadership. So I, I wanted to touch on everything that, uh, oh, you know what? I actually have something else that's, that I've been cooking up the last couple of days. I kind of like this one. So um, this one is for you, John. John Carpe over there. Um, I don't like the fact that charities and churches aren't allowed to have a political opinion rubs me the wrong way. So, under my leadership, charities and churches will be allowed to have a political opinion and endorse a candidate in a political race. Now, we, now to keep all those left-wing groups that say they're charities but they're really political activists from being charities, will still limit your involvement in politics to, you know, 10% of your budget or something like that. But having an opinion, a church should be able to get up there and say, you know what, in this election, there's moral issues at stake. This candidate represents those issues better than this candidate. I believe this, I believe this person's worthy of your vote. That's very simple. That's not uh, putting all your money into politics. That's not doing anything like that. It's having a political opinion, which is your charter right to have. And I think that a charity, particular, I mean, we live in a time where, uh, you know, for, uh, in John's work, for example, one leader could be way better for the issues that he, and we know it's true, particular leader could be way better for his type of issues that he's dealing with than another. And it's very true, and yet he's handcuffed by his status uh, to, to actually endorse a party or a candidate, and that's a problem. So that's something, that's something that, I would, that I would change. So um, this, is about, this is about getting Canada back to the, the, free, the freedoms that we deserve, the freedoms that uh, make our country strong, and we need to take them very seriously. We need to make freedom our election issue. As far as I'm, as far as I'm concerned, um, I can't be bought, I can't be sold. Um, everybody on my campaign team, there's no high price consultants. They're all people who uh, are as committed to this cause as myself. Many of them are young, uh, not all of them, but many of them uh, skew to, towards the younger side of things. And we're committed to making the country a better place. No backing down, no retreat, and no apologies. So thank you so much for having me here today. 
and I'd be glad to take some of your questions. I can mention you that. that. Yeah. Sure, go ahead and mention that. Yeah, so, uh, so, there, yeah, so I will be in a debate moderated by Andrew Lawton here on July 29th. That'll be in Toronto, and that is uh, uh, sponsored by the Independent Press Gallery, uh, who I'm a fan of. And, uh, <laughs> And uh, I've been very uh, open to talk to uh, all different forms of alternative media. So that's do, great. Do we have a question? Yes, go ahead. We'll have one, two. No, go ahead. You know, got you first. Yeah. Question. Many years ago, and I think it was when Paul Martin was prime minister, China became a big nation in the area of um, in, imports and, and, and what have you. And, and our country was flooded with Chinese made goods. Hello? Um, the smaller family-owned operations. Um, are you going to do anything about encouraging Canada Made instead of all of these Chinese made goods? I, I Many times I would go to a store to try and find something not made in China and it became absolutely impossible. Just repeat the question, just sort of summarize it real quick before you answer. Yep. So, so the question was, um, so she feels that over the decades with all the Chinese goods that have come in and, and harmed Canadian industry, what will I do to promote Made in Canada? So that's great, and I didn't get a chance to talk about that, and that is also something I, that's in my plan. Um, I was involved in an industry before I started a furniture store in Oshawa, which uh, was also impacted by that. And I saw the destruction of the Canadian furniture industry over a period of a couple of decades. And I, so I, for one, don't think it's a good idea that every single thing we see is from China. I don't think, um, I don't think that's a help to Canada. And uh, so my plan revolves around, uh, we have a Made in Alberta plan already where you, where you put stickers and stuff on things. Ontario is talking about that. that. Those are both great. We need to have a Canada-wide one so that people know on all their products and even on food uh, where the stuff is coming from. So that's, so that's one, one aspect, educating people. But we really do need to, to move away from, from this extreme uh, getting flooded with these kinds of goods from China. And I'm not saying cold turkey. But we definitely need to move away from that because, and I think we can differentiate ourselves on quality. And countries like Germany have done that, where they have a great made in Germany uh, uh, ability to do that because they, they focus on quality. We need low energy prices and, focus, and a focus on quality, and I think we can, we can gain ground. Yeah. Lee Eddy, and then Milan, they've got, they've got to be short questions. They've got to be short questions. that you can beat Justin Trudeau? The question was, can I beat Justin Trudeau? The answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, here, here. Uh, so the only, way, the only way that we can beat Justin Trudeau is if we are conservative on all aspects. So we can't just be economy-only conservatives. We have to have good ideas in all of these fronts we have, to, we have to start eating into the, 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 family, uh, the family and the blue collar vote as well. Uh, being strong on energy and being strong on you know, cost of living stuff can help us there. We have to have bold vision for Canada, not just, hey, if you put your kid in soccer, I'll save you 200 bucks. You know, we had a whole list of these types of things in the last election. Those, I mean, that's fine if you wanna you know, do that, but we need a vision for Canada and we need bold policy ideas that back it up. Derek, look at me. I'm seemingly in a white privilege room. In my view, one of the most destructive policies in Canada is multiculturalism. What are you going to do about it? Well, that's a really good question. So I, I didn't get to talk about this too much, but um, I did talk about um, I did talk about reducing immigration levels uh, to bring us in line with other developed countries. So right now our immigration rates are higher on average by, by quite a bit than other developed countries. So I think we need to bring our immigration levels down. I think that will uh, promote um, the, uh, the, the concept of um, you know, people integrating into society. When we're, when we're having fewer people, they can integrate better. I also think that we need to promote Canadian history and Canadian values. Um, 
I mean, there's, there's, nothing, there's, nothing wrong with be, there's nothing wrong with being from any country or any culture, but of course, the reason that people are coming here is because they like Canadian history, they like Canadian values, and they like Canadian culture. So I think, I think that's more or, less, more or less the way that we do it. Yeah. My name is Drew Barnes. Thank you Hi, very, Drew. very much for being here today. You do have a lot of support in Alberta, so good luck and keep going. Thank you. I just had the opportunity to be on the Fair Deal panel yes. where thousands of Albertans went to the mic and spoke of how frustrated they are with our relationship with Ottawa. 25% of Albertans are already at the point where they immediately wanted to leave. Up to 80% are saying they want a fairer deal or else. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what that or else means. I think we'll find out in the near future. The three things that kept coming up were the federal government constitutionally being involved in environment regulations whether it's the carbon tax, C69 or C48, it's not clearly defined in the Constitution between whose responsibility that is, provincial or federally. Secondly, equalization. Equalization transfers more CP, CPP, more tax. Albertans spend 20 to $40 billion more per year that go to, goes to Ottawa than ever comes back up here, out here. We are very, very frustrated with that, especially at a time that our economy is bad. Derek, and how deep this goes, if you want to be a federal court judge, and there's hundreds of them, you have to reside in Ottawa, which keeps a lot of good Albertans from wanting to go there. Diversification money for regions. Per capita, we're much, much lower. These kind of examples go on and on. And I just want to make sure I want to hear what, what you think about the level of Alberta dissatisfaction and how you can handle those things for us. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think everybody heard that. That was a good question. Yeah. So I think a lot of the so I think a lot of the the ideas that were raised on the fair deal panel are good, and and I think you're right. I think Ottawa is uh, is there's too much incursion into provincial autonomy, certainly, and particularly in the in what you'd mentioned there. So um, I believe I believe we absolutely uh, we absolutely have to address uh, represent, representational issues. So that's both in the House of Commons and in the Senate. We have to address equalization absolutely. There's no question about that. And there's different ideas on how to do it, and I've read some different reports on, you know, maybe the fiscal stabilization, upping that is the way to go. I don't know. But the, the fact is, is that we need to come up with a solution that, that uh, Albertans like and feel that, you know, they're an equal partner in Confederation as opposed to uh, being a satellite uh, state. So you're right. This is, you know, the issues you're raising are the most crucial issues that the next federal leader will have to face. And um, they have to go into it with their eyes open. And they have to realize this is more than just energy. This is about real structural changes. And, um, you know, um, I, I mean, frankly, I believe we need, to, we need to make some, we need to get to the table and talk about some certain constitutional changes. I think that's really the way to address it. So thank you. Yeah. We actually have about, we have about five people that want to ask a question, but I, I'm going to let Jason Wilson ask the last question because, as you know, he spoke earlier and we sort of cut his time off before we got to ask him questions. So those of you that would like to ask a question, if you'd like to write them down, we'll be sure that they get asked tonight at the fireside. So this is uh, your fireside chat with Derek. So Jason, go ahead with the last question and then we'll take a break. So go ahead. Thanks, Derek, for coming. Uh, I appreciate your stances on abortion and... Uh, sex change surgeries and even uh, gun rights, firearm rights, but why do you think that's federal jurisdiction? Why, why can't those be under provincial, even local jurisdiction that, which would better depict the very vast difference in opinions across the country? I mean, cultural issues should not ever be issues that federal politicians thousands of miles away that decide on. I mean, that should be left up to the grassroots pe people. Well, I, I'm not against having more provincial authority over uh, firearms uh, regulation. I think that's a good idea. Although um, it would be unfortunate for someone who is living in a left-leaning province uh, that decides to crack down. So, I, you know, it, it, it really depends on... Um, you know, I guess it depends on who's leading the country and what they want to do. But I'm not against giving uh, more control over provinces to that. When it comes to uh, things like banning sex change operations, um, I don't think that's a cultural thing. I think that's a common sense thing. I don't think that kids should be able to make those decisions. And I think that, um, 
I think that that's certainly something that, that uh, it would fall under federal jurisdiction. Um, abortion as well is not, when it, we're talking about abortion, we're not necessarily talking about um, regulating health care. We're talking about, uh, you know, criminal protections or some sort of limitations on abortion, which every other country in the world has. And there's nothing wrong with Canada having that conversation. I mean, if you look at Europe, I mean, countries like Germany have in their constitution that life begins at conception. They require counseling. They have strict limits of when abortion can occur. I mean, Germany is supposedly a liberal, uh, you know, utopia. And yet all these countries have very uh, limited laws on these things. So we can have conversations on these. I, I, I think that, you know, for some of those issues, um, you know, I, I think there's different, depending on what aspect you're addressing, it might be provincial, uh, it might be federal, but, uh, but I think there's a role for the feds as well. Thank you.